Over to you, Heather. Good morning. Are we live and ready to go, Carolyn? We are live. Excellent. Good morning, everyone. We are so thrilled to be here with you today, and I'm thrilled to present with these great people today. So we're excited to talk about a topic that we are passionate about, which is innovative um, approaches to PD. So we'll tell you a little bit more um, as we go through. Um, but I'm with three fantastic colleagues, and Carolyn, we're just going to show the next slide so that everyone can follow along with them on Twitter if you'd like to participate in the conversation as we present today. Um, we are um, we're presenting with Mr. Bronke, Chris Bronke, who is out of Illinois. Um, and what I love about the collection of people we have today, Chris is a department chair in a high school. And we also are working with Emily uh, Meissner, Dr. Emily Meissner from TCNJ. She is a professor of English education, so she comes with a different perspective. And then also we're uh, presenting today is Una Abrams, who is a high school classroom teacher. Um, I'm very lucky because she's in my classroom, uh, or in my school. Um, and then I am a K-12 curriculum coordinator. So I think that we're bringing unique perspectives to this conversation. Um, so you can see how we each approach PD differently, take charge of our own PD, um, and continue to grow as professionals. So next, Carolyn, on the slideshow. Those are our Twitter handles. Please feel free if you'd like to tweet us throughout the session. Um, we'll be following along. Carolyn will be helping us field some of uh, your questions that come through. And you can follow us using, of course, the EdCollab Gathering um, hashtag as well. And we are session number seven. We're just going to go to our next slide and tell you about how we all came to meet. So we are all members of the Conference on English Leadership. And the Conference on English Leadership is an organization that lives under NCTE's big umbrella. And our organization is designed specifically for those in leadership roles, though the roles we might be in look very differently as are represented by the people who are participating today. So people in our organization are department chairs, they are supervisors, they are lead teachers, they are team leaders, they are English educators, they are those who are new to the education field, they are bloggers, they are anyone who is taking a leadership role, whether it's formal or informal, literacy coaches, this is a great organization for you. So we design professional learning opportunities to support leaders in their growth um, as they lead literacy programs. So that was our commercial for CEL, and I thank the Ed Club for allowing us to uh, do that. So today we're talking about PD, and PD matters tremendously. And unfortunately, PD gets a bad name um, sometimes. It has a kind of yucky reputation. PD sometimes feels like, oh, it's a PD day, um, and conjures up images of sitting in an auditorium or a cafe gymatorium uh, and listening to a speaker present to you um, all day long. And while there are times that that can be effective, we really see PD as an opportunity to truly grow professionally and chart your own path, and that there's not a one-size-fits-all way of doing that. Um, so what you're going to hear about today are several different approaches to planning PD, to implementing PD, and then to creating your own path for PD so that you can continue to grow as a professional as well as then support the teachers with whom you work to grow professionally as well. Our next slide says, what if? So also in our title is innovation, and I believe all innovative practice begins with that question, what if? And I live by that question because that is really where the learning and the growth happens. What if we did this? What if we tried that? Um, how might that change uh, how we approach things? So you'll see today that each of us, as we're presenting, starts with that what if question. Here is our wondering, what if we could do this? And then we'll take you on our path to show you how we made that a reality. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris Bronke now, and he is going to talk about some cross-discipline work that he did um, that changed how his school approached argumentative writing. So Chris, good morning. 
Good morning. Uh, thank you, Heather, and uh, thank you everyone who's out there watching today, and, and thanks to the Ed Collab and uh, Chris and his people for having uh, us. You know, what's cool about the work that I'm, I'm going to share, at least I think, is that when we hear cross-discipline work, we often think of integrating uh, different curricula, um, you know, that the science and math people are working together, or English and social studies. Um, and what, what this work was, was more cross-discipline when we think about specifically skills um, and what kids are saying. So if you think about it that way, um, I don't want it to be misleading as we start that this is going to be like, oh, an integrated studies program or like that sort of thing. It's more how teachers from different disciplines got together to improve their own professional development um, and thereby uh, student learning. So our what if question, um, Carolyn, if we could go to that slide, that would be great, was this idea of what if all students and teachers were using the same language? Um, there, you know, we have the Common Core, which kind of sets that up for us. But this all came out of a, a conversation in which a math teacher and an English teacher were trying to talk about argument. And the math teacher kept saying, well, you know, in my class, we have kids justify things. Um, and the English teacher's like, well, in my class, you know, we're having kids explain and argue. And so there was this back and forth with language. And so um, I kind of looked at that and said, this is a chance for us to, to try and uh, do some some work together. So the concept that came out of this work is we put together uh, two math teachers, two science teachers, and two English teachers into a cohort. Uh, Carolyn, if we could go one more slide, that would be great. Thanks. Perfect. And our goal was just what does argument look and sound like across the discipline? Uh, because of that conversation, we knew that we were talking about it like in different ways. And so we wanted to say like, really, ultimately, what are students talking about um, when they're when they're arguing in different disciplines? And does it sound different? Um, so we got this group together. Uh, this was work that personally I had been wanting to do at the district level for a while, but um, didn't kind of get the green light. So I said, well, this is a perfect opportunity. Um, here are six teachers who want to give up some of their time to, to work on this. So it was this cool combination of six teachers from three different disciplines being able to learn from one another while constantly focusing on and thinking about students. And so then the next thing that we tried to do was like, well, how do we do this? And so we started with a very simple argumentative mini lesson. Um, and I'm gonna show an example of it here in a little bit, but basically we took kind of like the AP language type question, right? Like, you know, read the following statement and then agree, disagree, or qualify with what you see. But the key was is that we had um, people coming in and, and, and filming these lessons. So if you think about it, the English teachers, the science teachers, and the math teachers were all asking their kids the same exact question. It had nothing to do with discipline, right? It wasn't a science question. There wasn't a math question or an English question. It was just one question, agree, disagree, or qualify. And what we were trying to do is capture what the kids were saying. We wanted to know with the same exact prompt, were the kids saying the same or different things depending on which classroom they were in? So when they were in math, were they using maybe the word justify as opposed to when they were in English, were they using the word, you know, argue or explain or analysis, like those sorts of things. So what was really cool about it, and I think a lot of times when, when leaders um, or teachers hear about filming classroom practices, part of the worry is that, you know, the, the, there's, there's just consternation there. Like, I don't want the film on me. I don't want people looking at, at my classroom practice. And, you know, teachers can be a little guarded with that. But what was cool with what we were doing is we were filming the students. Um, we didn't care about what the teacher was doing because there really wasn't much direct teaching going on. It was more of an argumentative activity. So we were able to film what the students were saying. And then we got back together and we listened to what students were saying to the exact same prompt in a science class, in a math class, and in an English class. Um, and, and guided by the general question of what surprised you. And so as we listened to that, we just kind of said like, wow, I'm surprised that this kid was saying this or that kid said this. And what that allowed us to do then was to uh, evolve this project. And so the, the, um, the next thing that we did is, okay, here's what kids are saying. Here's where they're similar or how they're different how can we do something with that? So here's the example of that first prompt that we did. We just gave them this really kind of wacky, goofy picture we found and said, okay, like, is this person appropriately dressed? And then they had to agree, disagree, or qualify. And it was really fascinating what we were hearing, but we were hearing kids saying different things in different disciplines. Um, that, you know, th those 
discipline specific languages were coming out, but were also a barrier to growing this work. And so as we thought about it as a team, you know, we had to really kind of brainstorm like, all right, how can we best help all students think about argument in more depth? And it, it really, the conversations between teacher became so exciting because there was there were two things happening at the same time. Like one, we were creating mini lessons for kids, which was awesome. Like it was student focused. It was based on student data, that being the video. But two, the professional development that was happening was these great conversations between teachers. I mean, you know, think about like how often, you know, if you're an English teacher right now, how often do you get to sit down and hear how they approach argument in AP Calc? Um, or if you're a biology teacher right now, like how often do you get to hear how they approach English in AP language or AP literature. Um, it was really cool too, because we had every spectrum sort of covered. So we had AP teachers and then we had teachers in like some of our like skills classes with, with our struggling readers or struggling scientists, struggling mathematicians. And so, you know, there, it wasn't just trying this at one level. I mean, we were across the board with it. Ultimately what came out of it, which I think is was really exciting. And Carolyn, if we could go to the, the last slide. And this is what's so cool, I think about the potential of professional de development is if districts and leaders can trust their teachers to work together to try and solve a problem, the unthinkable can happen. Um, and I think about like our work, you know, our simple what if was like, what if teachers and students in all disciplines are using the same language, which may seem pretty basic considering that like Common Core gave us the framework to do that. But at the same time, what came out of this was a five part mini lesson series that we developed called Developing Critical Thinking Through Multidimensional Arguments, in which not only are we systemizing the language that's used for argument across the different disciplines and growing as professionals as we work with the uh, you know, teachers from different disciplines, but the product here was a five part series in which quite frankly, the ultimate goal of it is to, to think about how empathy impacts argument. And so, you know, my general thought, I mean, you can see the different lessons that came out of here. You know, we were working on things like context and empathy. Um, we use some design thinking protocols to uh, think about the user personas of who might be thinking this about that argument. You think about that prompt that I showed you, is this person appropriately dressed? You know, the next step in that was that we had them say, okay, is this person appropriately dressed if it were San Diego in Halloween? or if it were Chicago in the middle of June, you know, that sort of thing. So just adding layers and it, the conversations, like I said, became super authentic. Um, we started to find ways to then take those argument mini lessons and the empathy that was built into, I mean, prepping for AP tests. Uh, you know, I mean, I think that's what the coolest things. A lot of times this sort of activity, you know, teachers might say, oh, that sounds really cool but I don't really have time for that, right? And we had AP Calc, AP Bio, AP Lang, and AP Lit all represented on this team. And all of them at this point are now saying like, I don't have time not to do this. A, to not be subbed out of my class, to be you know part of these conversations and growing and learning from the other disciplines. And I don't have time not to do these mini lessons in my classroom because once we start to develop that empathy, the language starts to matter a little bit less because it's coming from a, the argument itself is coming from a, a place of, um, like I said, you know, empathy and thinking about other people, uh, which just makes everything about it, you know, way more um, authentic and makes navigating counterclaim that much better. So with that said, um, I would strongly encourage if you're a district leader or someone who oversees PD to think about giving cohorts of teachers time to just solve a problem and see what happens from there. Thank you. Okay, I think Una actually is going to ask a question, Chris. So don't turn off your mic yet. All right. All right. Una, you have to unmute. I did. I, I figured. I got it. Um, Chris, yeah, I had some questions because I love the work that you all um, are doing. How did, um, how did you all find the time to work together? That I think is my, uh, you know, how did the administration support time to work together across those disciplines? And then what professional resources did you lean on for that design thinking element? I love that. Yeah, two great questions. So the the time one was a combination. I mean, truthfully, like most of it was that I put in a proposal and asked the admin for, for the money to get subbed out. Um, so this work came about over the course of, at this point now, about, um, about two full school years uh, of about mm, three half days a semester. 
probably something like that. Um, you know, truth be told, like one of the, the nice things, I'm on this team as a teacher because in my role as department chair, I teach one class, but I'm also kind of, you know, it's like pseudo admin. So like that helped. I kind of was able to navigate this teaching group, be part of it and know how authentic the work was and then sell that back to admin when I'm in my admin meetings. Um, in terms of the design thinking protocols, we actually kind of got lucky there as well. We didn't have to necessarily go to any resources. Um, I can try and look for some and add them to the Padlet that I see, you know, that we're sharing as part of our slide deck. Um, through some other consulting work that I had done, I've been through some pretty extensive design uh, thinking training. Um, so I just leaned on, on previous experience. But this idea, you know, at, at its core, design thinking is kind of what we're talking about today. It asks a, like a how might we, you know, how might we better do this? And then before you can think about how you improve this, you've got to think about who you're improving it for, right? So you've got to think about that end user. And so we, we transfer that into the student thinking for argument, right? Before I can make an argument, I've got to think about the end user who's going to be receiving that argument. Um, and not just generally speaking, like they say, I say, which is, I mean, a cool framework, but like literally who is that they? Um, and that really helped us and the students. It made me think of Launch, the book Launch. I cannot remember the name of the author. One of the authors was an English teacher. Um, the other one was was not because I live in the world of English teachers. But I will add that to our Padlet as well. Cool. I'll add the uh, the link to that book. So awesome. Thanks, Thank Chris. You. Thank you. OK, so we are now going to transition um, and talk about Genius Hour um, professional development, which has become my passion. Um, so Carolyn, we're just going to move to the next slide. And Genius Hour really was born out of an opportunity that I had to go to chaperone a field trip to Google, um, which was wonderful. And so during that trip uh, with a whole group of ninth graders, um, we learned about Google's 80-20 plan, where they spend 20% of their days pursuing topics that they love and are interested to them. And then we heard from um, Google employees about how influential that has been and then what ends up in their work life um, that comes out of that time that they spend learning. So moving on to the next slide, as I opened um, the session, most people feel this way when it's a PD day. Um, and we, I just don't want that to be. We are learners at heart. We don't want our students to feel this way in our classroom. So as someone who's leading professional development, I don't want our teachers to feel this way when they are um, entering into a professional development um, session or workshop, et cetera. So my what if question then became, um, what if, I was able to give teachers choice about their topic, what do they want to study, and then find the time for them to do that work. How might they grow professionally? What if they had the opportunity to say, you know, I really do want to develop um, you know, my use of technology within the classroom, or I really want to know more about um, students who are um, living with ADD and how to better approach them um, in my instruction. So that's where my what if question started. In a commitment to that then, moving to the next slide, is the time. So Una asked Chris, of course, how do you find the time? That is always the stress, is how do we make time to do that? And truthfully, um, as someone who is leading a department in the district, I have to be mindful of, we're supposed to have department meeting time, um, which I do like to keep sacred, but then those department meetings, we try to never make announcement meetings. They're really professional learning opportunities. But in our district, we also have several Mondays afternoons, typically about an hour in length or so, that are called PD Mondays. And when that first started, we were running courses and teachers got to choose what course they wanted to take, but it morphed into this individualized opportunity for them to find what is most interesting for them to study. So my making time was about taking that PD Monday and saying, I'm not going to dictate what that is instead for your own topic. So our process, I did bring this to the department before um, I launched it. So we had a conversation at the end of a school year and I kind of dangled it out there as what if, what if you had time and choice? Um, and teachers, of course, were uh, 
excited about the opportunity and then made the schedule and um, the, our schedule is made at the beginning of the year and I think that that is really a critical step it sounds perhaps elementary but it's about protecting that time and saying you are you definitely have these five or six Mondays as well as this in service day to your own study so making the schedule is really important and then and I'll talk about the topic selection here in a moment but that giving teachers the opportunity to share their topics amongst one another so that everyone can see what people are doing. We have a Google Doc on which we populate what we're studying for the year because teachers then can reach out to one another and say, oh, I know quite a bit about this, or I recommend this book for you to read, um, this website to look at, you should listen to this podcast. So that's been a wonderful um, exchange of ideas as well. And then we offer support as teachers are going through the Genius Hour um, time. So I've spent many times talking to teachers about what the project they're working on. Is there something else I can do in my role as their supervisor to help them um, with their study, as well as then practicing these things into their classroom. So when they are trying out a new writing you know, um, lesson, I love to go in and see it happen or at least support them before or after to look at the, its success. Um, so that's been ongoing. I will also say in New Jersey, and I'm assuming many other states have something similar, we have what's called a PDP plan, and that's the professional development plan that teachers create at the beginning of this year. And so one of these goals that they write on that plan is their genius out, becomes their genius hour work. So it also, meets the bureaucratic needs of um, the process as well, which I think is great, a good opportunity to uh, double dip. Um, so the next slide just shows you some examples of topics that people have chosen. Um, and so people work be to become a Google certified educator. People have been working with their classroom libraries and organizing their libraries, as well as then using it as an opportunity to read and find mentor texts that they can use as they teach writing. Um, one popular topic this year was researching methods on um, teaching students with learning disabilities. Um, and then you're gonna hear about one PD or Genius Hour uh, in a moment as Una shares about her nerd camp adventure. Um, so Una took that on as her Genius Hour goal and it is turning into not only her own professional development, but it will professionally develop teachers all over the state of New Jersey. So I can't wait for her to share that with you. Okay, so then moving on to the next slide there. So ultimately our goal is of course to um, bring their learning into the classroom. So how does what you learn during Genius Hour um, show up in your instruction? So teachers during department meetings, sometimes we turn and talk and just say, how's it going in your classroom? What have you learned so far? And how's that changing your teaching? And people are bringing samples in. Um, but I've also found that teachers have focused often on assessment and how they go about assessing students. So I've seen assessments improve in that they're becoming more authentic, more precise. Um, the writing assessment in particular has been a, a real area of focus for us, which has been great. Additionally, teachers share with their students, this is my genius hour product or project. Um, and I think it's great for students to see us as learners as well. Um, so they're excited to hear about what teachers are working on and they kind of embrace it even more. And let's try this out. Sure, we'll support you. I'm loving some of that feedback from teachers that the students really enjoy being a part of that as, as well. And then it just also promotes this consistent reflective practice, which is so important to growth as well. That teachers are always reflecting on, did this work? Where can I tweak it for next time? Um, and it's more organic as opposed to just filling out the end of the year self-reflection form. It's something they're constantly doing because they're working on these genius projects throughout the year. And as I said earlier, the collaborations that come out of it, again, truly organically, just because people are working on similar topics or they can support someone who's working on a topic about which they know quite a bit, it's been wonderful too. So it's built this collaboration in and amongst the department as well. 
And finally, we celebrate at the end of every year. So this is last year's Genius Hour celebration. Um, and we have another one coming up in May. And it's where people have, the teachers come together and they share what it is that they worked on. So there's um, Tony Ricciardi right there sharing with his small group. He studied um, students at the ADD actually last year. Um, and they collaborate, they share, they share student examples. Um, they talk about the books that they've read. Um, and now what comes out of that conversation is people now go to Tony and ask him questions about what he learned um, and so Tony then becomes the resident expert in the group as well which has been a great opportunity for us to build the leadership capacity of the teachers um, in the department so it's wonderful um, experience and um, Una of course can share more about it when she talks about nerd camp too but it's been a great opportunity for teachers to have choice I give them the time and they really run with it so, oh, Chris, you got a question? I do. Um, Ooh, 30 seconds. Great. I think this is wonderful. Um, I'm curious if you've had to and or if you did how um, you kind of deal with, uh, I'll hesitate to say, but we'll say like that teacher. Um, I know like some of the fear from like district admin on this a project with this amount of freedom um, is that it has this amount of freedom. Um, and I know that's a question I have to answer in my district when I propose things like this. So I'm curious if you had to navigate that at all. Um, not all that much, I have to say, because it is part of the PDP, which is an official growth project that everyone has to do. You know, it's the PDP had been set goals for yourself and we have building goals too. So sometimes it's a building goal, but then I always ask teachers to do an individual goal. And now it makes the PDP even more authentic because I'm actually providing them time to do that study. Before it was set a goal and then when you have time, do that study. Now it, it emphasizes how important it is that I, you know, growing professionally um, is to their work. So um, yeah, that's been a way that, because it is just an official part of the professional time, so. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so now we are gonna transition over to Una Abrams, who's going to talk about how she makes the most of her edge time to develop professionally. Hello, everybody, thank you very much. Um, so I got, I got that term edge time, it's not my own. I got it from Donalyn Miller uh, when she spoke at the Council on English Leadership Convention in 2013. She said most of the reading that we do, we do during edge time. And she, you know, she showed a picture of her husband and her children waiting for her at the airport and all of them were reading. Um, so thank you, Donalyn, for giving us that, that term and giving me that term, because that's my what if question, which I believe is on the next slide. And that question um, is, sorry, what if, um, you know, what if we could develop ourselves professionally by capitalizing on small pockets of time that we have? So I think as educators, and I, I love this next, this graphic on the next slide, this photograph, because, uh, you know, the time crunch. And I think as educators, we can agree that every second counts. So if you want the agency to design your own PD, then you start with the biggest problem in your school or in your classroom, maybe not the biggest problem in your school, but the biggest problem in your classroom, right? And you start, you start right now. I am in my fourth year of doing independent reading with my students at Chatham High School, so I'm gonna talk about that on the next slide. And I've also put a link on the Padlet to um, Heather's presentation from last year on independent reading, um, because she talks in depth about that. Um, with a panel from last year. So this year my seniors have moved over to a reading workshop model. 80% of the reading is choice and 20% is whole class texts. And I noticed even with choice that my students were falling behind on the schedules that they themselves had created. So yeah, problem. So I used Google Forms. Um, oh, no, no we're, on the, uh, we're on the previous slide, Carolyn, I'm sorry. I used Google Forms to create a survey and they gave me some actionable feedback. You know, uh, the students always tell you what you need to know if you ask. And I asked them about lots of factors that might be affecting their reading. The areas most in need of improvement were time management. So if you look at the graph there, the one that's off the charts is time management and distraction management. Those were the top two scoring categories. 
So I researched the Pomodoro method, which works very well with reading workshop at the high school level. Uh, a Pomodoro is a 25 minute unit. And we could practice that time management method in class and then they could do that, the same thing at home when they were reading. Um, but most importantly, that survey sent me back to Book Love by Penny Kittle and also Read Aside by Kelly Gallagher. And I realized that I needed to confer with my students much more frequently. Getting the right books into their hands was, you know, was step one, but they needed more guidance and strategies that would help them navigate their reading. And speaking of books, now on the next slide, um, I'm going to talk about even more of them, yay! <laughs> so. I screenshot my favorite excerpts from professional books, and I love to tweet those and tag the author, um, of course, to give the author credit as well, and to write my response to particular quotes. It's how I established a connection with lots of great authors. Um, two who come to mind are Paul Solars and uh, Doug Robertson. Um, and I'm lucky as an English teacher because reading of almost any kind is gonna benefit my students. And, and me, but I've got young kids and I have a spouse who travels all the time <laughs> um, and, and that travel schedule is often precarious. So there's really not much time for luxuries on the home front and I have to leverage technology to help me use edge time to read. So I use the OverDrive, the Cloud Library and the Hoopla apps to download audiobooks um, for free. And I also have info on that on our Padlet as well. I just couldn't fit it all on the slides. All of my book clubs are online. They're either on Twitter or on Boxer because as I said before, I can't really leave my house once I'm home. <laughs> kind of under house arrest sometimes. No Starbucks book club for me. So my favorite reading chats are 60 books and read for fun. Oh, I'm actually on the previous slide. I'm sorry, Carolyn. Um, and uh, both of which are quite manageable. I would highly recommend them time-wise. Uh, this month, Teresa Gross is hosting a Twitter book study on the gift of failure. Uh, by Jessica Leahy. And you know what I love about Twitter book, book uh, studies is that they run once a week and they allow for reflection time in between. You can read the book a little bit at a time and answer questions. And it, what I like about that also is I'm the gal that the few times that I have gone to a real book club, I'm like the person who's like, are we gonna talk about the book or like are we just gonna drink wine? Because I, I'm here to talk about the book. I'm very serious about my book clubs. So, uh, and, and you know, I know what some people watching this are thinking, but I'm not on Twitter that much or some of my colleagues think I'm weird to use Twitter. So if Twitter isn't where your school is right now and, and you don't wanna push things, because we know good change, like Mr. Bronke was saying before, comes over time. Um, if you don't want to push things, you can still create a PLN. We have a Shelfie Wednesday group for our faculty on our LMS on Schoology. And every week, teachers from our building post what they're reading, everything from picture books with our kids at home to some of the heavier tomes that are out there. Think about how you can leverage your LMS to create a book club group in your school. Um, and a Google Plus community is a great choice for that. If you're on in Google Classroom, I believe you can also use Google Plus. So one of my favorite Google Plus groups is the PB 10 for 10 community. They post top 10 lists of awesome picture books twice a year in the summer and in the winter. Um, I don't teach elementary school, but I have kids, so I love that, uh, you know, just for picture books for them. So now I'm on the next slide. Sorry, Carolyn. Um, so when you're at the gym or cooking dinner um, or doing the dishes, unpacking groceries, folding laundry, how long does that take you to do? In my house, longer than I'd like. So what if you could fill those usual edge times with self-selected PD? Um, so, you know, I belong to a book club group on Voxer where I can tap into a network of diverse teachers from all over the country, from a range of communities, and I listen to them and I talk to them as I'm doing some of those mundane tasks like doing the dishes, what have you. Um, and I also have a 45 commute in the morning. That, that is not my minivan, just FYI. Mine's a lot more beaten up looking. Uh, but it, sometimes it could take up to an hour for me to get home in the afternoon. So I maximize on that time and I talk to some of my critical friends from Twitter, like Susie Hiley, Mary Lou Buell, love you guys. Um, and I know one person whom I have been talking to on Boxer a lot lately is Sarah Mulhern Gross. Um, she is uh, one of the five co-organizers of Nerd Camp New Jersey, which I'm going to discuss on the next slide. How am I doing on time? Am I all right, everyone? We good? Thumbs up? Okay, all right. So get ready to nerd out, everybody. Uh, Heather was talking about Genius Hour PD. Heather is my supervisor, and my Genius Hour project this year is planning Nerd Camp New Jersey. 
After attending Nerd Camp Michigan and also Nerd Camp Long Island, I decided to organize this. And Sarah, Emily, right here, uh, Gerard Dawson and Christina McCabe are all on the nerdy team. So Nerd Camp is an ed camp with a literacy twist. It's going to be on May 20th at Chatham High School. We have over 70 authors coming out, over 300 educators and librarians, administrators, and it's all happening because I was given freedom to develop my own PD project. And so thank you, Heather, for offering your department that opportunity, and to my principal, Darren Grow, for graciously allowing us, uh, the school, to host the event. And I hope I make my CHS family proud. So as Heather mentioned earlier, we are all cellmates in the best possible way, cellmates, C-E-L, cellmates. We are um, members of the Council on English Leadership, and that, that's up on the next slide. And this is my final year. I'm going rounding the home stretch of editing CEL's journal, English Leadership Quarterly. And it's the primary way I develop myself professionally because I pretty much select themes that are learning opportunities, um, and then I crowdsource for the best and the brightest. But as a writer, the first article I had published in ELQ was a reflection and it was not research-based. And another option that you can, you know, that you can offer is to write a reflection for a professional journal, a short piece, um, or do, uh, do something like a guest post on a blog. So another option is to volunteer to peer review manuscripts. You likely get insights into some new content or strategies. Both Chris and Emily have been peer reviewers for um, English Leadership Quarterly, and they've developed fantastic relationships with people that they have helped to bring into the organization as well. So um, one of my best and high quality PD experiences was submitting a manuscript to NJCTE. New Jersey Council of Teachers of English, and having it peer reviewed. And just going through that process to see it published um, in the New Jersey English Journal, it, it made me a better teacher of writing uh, because I had to be receptive to feedback. I had to know what it was to revise my work. And you know, students know when you're not doing what they are doing. So um, that helped a lot. Um, but in any event, we're going to be tweeting information about upcoming issues and calls for manuscripts. We have four um, issue themes before I finish with the um, editorship. And our new editor is Elaine Simos, who works with Chris at Downers Grove North. Um, so the final four issue themes are leveraging librarians. So if there are librarians out there that are listening to this, I'm a talking to you. That's my Jersey accent there, or my attempt at one. Uh, tasking time and taking time is another one, how we manage instructional time. Con and conferring with learners and colleagues is another theme. And then Elaine's, uh, it, Elaine's first issue that she and I are going to collaborate on is social emotional learning. So we would love to see our Ed Collab friends submitting manuscripts, okay? And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Una. And now we're going to chat with Emily Meixner, who's going to tell you how she supports new teachers who develop their own PD plans um, with her before they even leave school. Emily. Hello, everybody. So I'm Emily Meixner. I work at the College of New Jersey. Um, as you can see from my first slide, one of the big questions that I have is how do we get students um, involved in PD and thinking about PD even before they get their first job? So for me, um, one of the questions as I look at the students in my methods classes is how do I get them to understand why professional development is important? So that when they go out into schools, they're already seeking it, they're already asking about it, they're already seeing themselves within it. Um, so Carolyn, if you go to the next slide, my question um, for this presentation is what if teachers were invested in professional development before they became teachers. So that's one of the things that I've been working on um, as the coordinator of the secondary English education program here. Um, so if you go to um, the next slide, there are three different ways that I've been trying to engage um, students and then novice teachers, my new alumni, in professional development to kind of cultivate their experience with it so that they have expectations for it when they get into their first jobs. So the three ways that you can see on the screen there, one is by having regular co-curricular events on campus. And um, we call them how to teach events. And this comes from um, an experience that I had very early in my career here where I would be talking about methods with my students and then they would say, but yeah, that's fine, that's fine. But how do I teach said novel? 
And so I kept saying to them, well, you know, all these methods that we're learning, that's how you, how you teach those things. And they didn't believe me. So what I would do is I would offer these professional development seminars where um, new alumni would come back to TCNJ and give presentations on how to teach a particular novel. And they found that very satisfying. Um, but one of the things that I really like about that program was that it um, allowed them to see themselves as young teachers. I'll say a little bit more about that in just a second. So the second prong, um, Carolyn, if you want to go back to that slide, um, is they are all required to develop a five-year professional development plan in the capstone um, course that they take as seniors. And this really gets them thinking about, well, once I leave TCNJ, what am I going to do next? What kind of professional development do I need? Um, what are my options? What are professional organizations? And I'm going to show you an example of what one of those looks like. Uh, the third prong, which is the one that's in orange, is how do I get them to see themselves as part of a professional community um, and communicating within that professional community even after they graduate? Um, my students tend to love this school very much, um, but I want to keep them close and I want them to understand that we continue um, to help each other grow as teachers even after they graduate, that we're still here for each other and we provide resources for each other. So, let me show you, Carolyn, if you want to go to the next slide, let me show you some examples of some of the how to teach experiences that our students um, have. And I actually just did one of these on Thursday night, you'll see from the date. But we've done a bunch of different things. So I had a couple of alumni here a couple of days ago, and they were talking about a new summer reading program that they um, had developed at their school. And that got us talking about summer reading in general and thinking about literacy and building cultures of reading in our classroom. And that's something that I talk a lot about in my classes. But to have teachers out in the field verify for them that that's important and getting them thinking about their own responsibilities, that's really helpful. Um, some of the other programs that you'll see from that slide that we've done are we've done tech experiences um, where I had students and alumni come in and share some of the new techie um, moves that they were making in their classes, and that was really useful. Um, we've had actually a, a cellmate of ours, Matt Marone, who's a teacher um, up in northern Jersey. He came and did this amazing session on using Twitter in the classroom. And again, a lot of the methods that the students are seeing, my students are seeing, are methods that we talk about in class. But then when they're confirmed as user friendly and that they work for the students, um, for their students, that's really, really, really helpful. So Carolyn, if you go to the next slide, I'll show you um, what one of the professional development plans looks like. I know that the type is very small, but you can see that we have them thinking in terms of, you know, once they graduate, what do they want to do? Um, you know, what are they thinking about reading? What kinds of graduate programs potentially are they interested in? Do they want to attend regional conferences or do they want to attend national conferences? I talk up um, CEL and NJCTE and NCTE in my classes. Are those things that they, you know, they want to start saving for? Um, are there professional books that they want to read? Do they plan to come back? Um, to the how to teach events, you know, so that they can stay connected on campus. So we have them thinking about those first couple of years. Then we have them thinking a little bit more long term. Well, once you've been out in your school for a while, what do you think your responsibilities will be then? Is that the time that you move into graduate work? Or could you actually begin to, right, take on some leadership roles in your school as a teacher leader, as a teacher mentor? Could you be doing presentations? Do you want to come back and give one of these how to teach presentations? So that's all, again, a part of them thinking before they even get to a job about what it is that they want to contribute to the profession, but also why it is that professional development can be meaningful for them, right? Not just by taking classes here at TCNJ, but why it can be meaningful for them as they continue to grow as a professional at different stages of their career. So the third piece I'll show you really quickly um, is, and if you go to the next slide, Carolyn, we have a Facebook group. It's a closed group just to TCNJ alums. Um, and I have about 260 participants. Um, and this, I try to show you sort of a variety of different kinds of conversations that we have each, with each other. Um, but a lot of this, this organization and this group is about celebrating each other's successes. Um, sometimes our, our new alumni get fellowships or they get into grad schools or we have people who are graduating from graduate programs. We've had um, 
students honored as uh, county teachers of the year or school district teachers of the year. So we try and publicize that as a way of celebrating achievements. Um, we appreciate each other's strengths. Lots of people um, have knowledge in certain areas that they're willing to share. Um, I will also provide announcements to things that are happening on campus so that if they want to come back, they can. Um, and it gives them an opportunity to talk to each other. Sometimes I think novice teachers, when they go out into schools, they're afraid to ask questions because they don't want to look like they don't know what they're doing. Um, but here's a place where they can come and talk to colleagues um, who also went through this program, who are familiar with the kinds of methods that we advocate, and they have a safe space for um, engaging in the kind of professional development that they need. So it serves a number of different purposes. So for those of you who are working in English ed programs, um, these are the three things that have been really working for me to habituate our graduates into really thinking about and asking for and looking meaningfully for professional development experiences post-graduation. So I will stop. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emily. I love this so much. I wish that when I was in um, school, I walked out of the university with a five-year plan to help me see myself always as a learner. So that was great. Um, okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for your time today. I know the four of us are really, really grateful. Thank you to Chris and Emily and Una for jumping on this um, opportunity with me. It was so fun to prepare and present with you. I think that we should submit a proposal to St. Louis for CEL. So this is our last CEL commercial, but we just love the organization so much. Just so you know, right after um, NCTE concludes, CEL holds its own annual convention, and we are always looking for literacy leaders to submit proposals. So you can do it right there. Um, if you want to continue to learn about professional development or share what you're doing in your own districts, um, this is a great opportunity to do that. And last slide, just keep in touch. We'd love to continue the conversation with you. You can reach out to any of us on Twitter and we'll happy to answer any of the questions that you have. We also, I believe, tweeted out a Padlet. If not, we will do so. That links to all of the resources that we talked about today. Thanks to Una for preparing that for us. And uh, Una, yes. I did, no, I did tweet out okay, the link great. to the Padlet to the EdCollab hashtag. Fantastic. So you can go there and get all the resources that you need. Thanks again. There's so much exciting stuff coming up for the rest of the day. Thanks to Chris Lehman and Ed Cloud for letting us present today. And thank you so much, Carolyn, for supporting us technologically. Have a great day, everybody. Hi everyone. So just before we before we um, before we go stop broadcasting here, I just wanted to share with you a couple things. Um, I just want to share with you the upcoming presentations for um, the day so you do have a good sense of what's coming up next. So um, we have some exciting pre pre presentations coming up with um, Chris and Emma, uh, and Amy. Chris, Amy, Brittany, and, ja uh, and Jancy talking about the Global Kind Project. That's in session three. Also, we have Tanji uh, Marshall talking about invite invitations to examine critique and engage critical media literacy in the age of co in the common core standards. We also have Ruth Ayers talking about moves to make for enticing hard to reach writers. So do stay with us for those and, um, and uh, continue the learning. Thanks again for joining us um, and see you soon. Bye-bye.